totally booked. Rock and roll! Well, I think I'll leave you to your reading. Little Hand says it's time to rock and roll. Rock and roll on! We are totally booked. Welcome back to the Booked on Rock podcast. If you haven't yet, make sure you subscribe and give us a five-star review if you can. A listing of all the major platforms where you can listen to the podcast on our website, bookedonrock.com. Boy, what a guest we've got this week, Michael Goldberg. He's on the podcast to talk about his amazing new book, Wicked Game, the true story of guitarist James Calvin Wilsey. If you don't recognize the name James Calvin Wilsey, odds are you have heard him. His hypnotic guitar work on Chris Isaac's top 10 single from 1989, Wicked Game, made Isaac an international star. But there's much more to Jimmy's story than his guitar work on this iconic song. Goldberg's book is an incredibly in-depth look into the dark side of San Francisco in the 1970s and 80s, and the dark side of rock and roll in general, through the wild life of one Jimmy Wilsey. Wilsey was the heart and soul of the San Francisco punk band The Avengers and worked with Chris Isaac for over a decade before he crashed and burned. Wicked Game, the true story of guitarist James Calvin Wilsey, includes over 100 photos and flyers by avant-garde artist Bruce Conner, Avengers singer-songwriter Penelope Houston, Blondie's Chris Stein, Ruby Ray, Chester Simpson, Sue Brisk, Marcus Leatherdale, Amy Starks, Michael Zagaris, Hugh Brown, James Stark, Jimmy Wilsey himself, and others. Author Michael Goldberg is a journalist, novelist, and photographer. He's been interviewing and photographing musicians since he was 17. He was a senior writer at Rolling Stone magazine for a decade. His writing also appeared in Esquire, New Musical Express, Cream, Downbeat, New York Rocker, Trouser Press, Musician, New West, Vibe, New Times, The San Francisco Chronicle, among other publications. You can listen to a playlist of the music we cover in this episode. Just head over to the show notes page to listen. Now, let's hear from Michael Goldberg. Michael, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. I want to start with your relationship with Jimmy. Can you take us back to when you first met him, which I believe, according to the book, is back in 1982? Yeah, I had seen Jimmy play in the Avengers. Back in uh, 1978, uh, possibly even at the end of the 70s, as, as you know, like 70, I might have seen him in 77, but I definitely saw him in 78 because I took photographs of the Avengers at the Mabue Gardens, and Jimmy was uh, was at that show, and I also saw them open for the Sex Pistols at Winterland, but I didn't actually meet Jimmy until 1982. When I was um, I was researching a story I was doing on rising bands, important new rising bands in the Bay Area for the San Francisco Examiner, and a band that people kind of kept mentioning was this band Silvertone. And so I went to um, the Berkeley Square, a club in Berkeley, uh, to see them play, and they were just great. People sort of kind of shorthand talk about them as 50s sound or rockabilly, you know, but actually that wasn't, their thing was, was much more than, than that. I mean, just, just that they weren't imitating old rockabilly bands. I mean, they were influenced by the 50s rockers, but they were also influenced by the early 60s rockers and they were influenced by contemporary things that were, that were happening at the time in the you know, early 80s. And by the way, saw, lead singer was Chris Isaac. Yeah. See, Chris Isaac wasn't Chris Isaac back then. Jimmy Wilsey, the guitar player, was a much bigger star in the local Bay Area scene. I mean, Chris Isaac was a guy from Stockton that basically had come up from, from Stockton and trying to get a band together, and he'd formed a trio, but he'd never been in a band before. Nobody knew who Chris Isaac was. Jimmy Wilsey had been one of the stars of the San Francisco punk scene when he was playing bass in the Avengers. You know, he'd, he'd played Winterland. He'd opened for the Sex Pistols. They'd packed the Mabue Gardens. Like, hey, 400 people packing the place. The San Francisco punk scene was a small scene, but in that scene, he was one of the big shots, although he would never look at himself like that. But anyway, so 
so but by you know by 1982 you know chris isaac had had begun to got to to be known in the local scene and he was the front person in silvertone and i saw them and they were just they were just great i mean i they just it just knocked me out and so they were one of the bands that i wrote about four bands in this article for the san francisco examiner which at the time the examiner was one of the two major dailies in san francisco and that was the that night eric jacobson the producer and manager co-manager took me backstage and introduced me to the band and that's the first time i met jimmy is that where that picture on the cover comes from is that around that time period that picture is actually when jimmy was in the avengers that was apparently was taken at the mabue gardens so i would say that's from from about 1978 Wow. He's just a kid there. At that point, he's like 19 years old, maybe 20. For those not familiar with Jimmy, can you give us a brief backstory as to where he's from? He was born in Indiana, but it wasn't, yeah, he wasn't his, there for more than a couple of weeks, right? It's, yeah, uh, his dad was in the Air Force. And so, you know, military family moved around quite a bit, settled for a while in, in Kansas City, then moved to St. Louis, and then eventually settled in a suburb called Florissant, uh, which is a bit outside of, of St. Louis. And that was kind of where he, you know, he, he spent his teenage years, essentially. And then the thing was, he wanted to get out of there. He figured it out while he was in high school that nothing was happening there in this in this suburb where, where he was growing up. And so he he decided San Francisco was where he wanted to go. He was both a, a visual artist and he played music, but his, but he thought his career was going to be as an artist, a visual artist. And he came out to San Francisco to go to an art school out here. And then, you know, things took a different turn because he got out to San Francisco in August of 1976 and the punk scene in New York was already well underway at that point. The British scene was happening right then. Sex Pistols were happening. So the first, basically the first punk shows in San Francisco happened in December of 1976. This place that was a Filipino restaurant became a punk club. And at first... There were just a few few punk shows a month there, but pretty quick, it was every night. And pretty quick, it was just amazing. Bands were just like popping up right and left. And before you knew it, I mean, there were just dozens and dozens of, of you know, brand new bands. And the Mabue Gardens would pretty much let anybody, give anybody a shot. So Jimmy pretty quickly started going to the Mabue Gardens every night. And he was totally digging, digging the scene there. And the thing was, Jimmy had started playing guitar back in the in his um, I don't know maybe when he was a um, sophomore, you know, in in high school, maybe a little earlier. But that's around when he started playing guitar. And he would jam with his friends. And you know, first it was like acoustic guitar that was around the house, and then he. He got himself a 12-string guitar because he was into David Bowie, and David Bowie was playing a 12-string at that point. And then he got himself a Telecaster copy and then a Stratocaster. And all along the way, as he's doing this, he's becoming a better guitar player. And, and you know, he's jamming with his friends. They're, they're playing all these songs by the Rolling Stones and Neil Young and other artists that he's into at the time. But he doesn't seriously think that he can be a musician because – you know, he would go see people like Jeff Beck and it would just be like, there's no way, you know, there's just no way I'm ever going to be able to like do anything like that. You know, this was the time, the pre-punk time. It was like there were these big superstars up there and that kind of thing was just unattainable. That's the way a lot of people looked at it anyway. Well, Jimmy saw the Patti Smith group on Saturday Night Live. And he loved the Patti Smith group, but he also basically said to himself, well, I could play that. This is not 
something that's out of my reach. I could, I could actually be in a band like that. And so when he came out to San Francisco and the San Francisco punk scene starts, I mean, he's, he goes and sees the Avengers. This, this is now in about in like June of 1977 because he's been going to the Mabue all along. And then when the, when the Avengers start playing there, he goes to see them. He just loved the Avengers. And he said to his girlfriend, I can do that. I could, I, you know, in fact, I could be play better than that guy. Who, who, this, there was a guy playing bass, Jonathan Postal. I could play better than that guy. And she's like, well, you don't play bass. And he's like, doesn't matter. I, I could do it. And so he approached the singer, Penelope Houston. He ran into her. And that's actually at City Lights Bookstore, which was the uh, kind of the center of the beat scene, you know, in North Beach at that point, or one of the centers of it anyway. And he ran into her and he said, hey, could you use another guitar player in the band? She says, no, but do you play bass? He doesn't play bass, but he says to her, yeah, I play bass. Uh. Sure, no problem. <laughs> so she says, well, you, you got to talk to our drummer, Danny, and to the guitar player, Greg, but... I'd certainly be up for, you know, letting you audition. So he runs into Greg Ingraham, who's the guitar player in the Avengers at the Mabue Gardens, and says to him, you know, well, can I play bass in your band? And, you know, and it's just like this thing of like, well, do you have a bass? No. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever played bass? <laughs> no. <laughs> and, but Greg said the thing about Jimmy was he says this guy – you just wanted him in your band. It was like his personality and his vibe, his whole thing was just like, yeah, this guy would be great in our band, you know, just to have this, this guy in the band, you know, I hope he can play, but, but God, you know, we got to get this guy in the band. Kind of the same it's, vibe he got in high school. They say the junior high and high school, yeah. they love to hang with him. Yeah. People just, people just, he, and I can tell you, Jimmy was the kind of guy you just liked to hang out with. He that, just Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. How, how, what type of relationship did you have with Jimmy? Well, you know, I got to know him during the 80s because periodically, I mean, I did probably a half a dozen stories about or more about Chris Isaac. And I did not appreciate during that time how important Jimmy was to the sound of the band. I loved his guitar playing. I thought he was absolutely great. I didn't realize that he was really instrumental in how these songs actually sounded. You know, it was more than just being the guitar player in in a band that's playing Chris Isaac's song. It was a lot more than that. So I'd gotten to know him a bit. I in, had interviewed him um, for stories that I had written, but it was it was in um, 19, 1991. It was. Wicked Game was a hit, and that was the point where I did a story about Jimmy. I, I did a profile of him for Guitar Player Magazine. So we were kind of hanging out a bit in the course of me doing that story. Then I started an independent record company called National Records, and I had this idea that Jimmy should do an instrumental album because he was totally into – you know, he, he would play in the Chris Isaac band. They would do some of these uh, these 60s, you know, kind of surf instrumentals and, and other other instrumental pieces, particularly when they would get into the encore phase of the set. And Jimmy had, he was like one of the first people who was using software that let you turn your Macintosh computer into a four-track tape recorder. And actually they used some of these programs that were just being developed at that time for Wicked Game in terms of edits and, and things. But anyway, when I went over to Jimmy's place, he showed me what he, how he was working on these songs and how he could do all these overdubs because he could bounce tracks together. Because if you have four tracks, then you're really in a position to, you bounce stuff to tracks three and four, and now you free up one and two, and now you can overdub on those, and then you bounce that and three and four together. Which is so you know common I mean? today, but at that time, that was, that was ahead no, of the game. That, it, it was unheard of. It, 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 this was the beginning. 
This was before there was no Pro Tools. This was a program that became part of Pro Tools. And so, and Jimmy was, um, he was actually do a consultant for uh, Apple computers beginning in 87. And he was a very computer savvy guy. So anyway, I started going over to his place and we were, we started getting to know each other and he'd invite me over and, you know, we'd watch Rolling Stones videos. And I mean, at one point he gave my son um, guitar lessons because he was a nice guy. I mean, it was like, so we'd go over there every week for a while and he'd show uh, my son, you know, how to play different songs that, that my son wanted to learn how to play. So we, we were friends on a, you know, it was just sort of a casual thing that developed. He gets into some of his family history with you, I'm assuming, because it's in this book. It's well, no, no, that was the thing. Jimmy didn't talk about his past. He talked about everything was sort of what was happening in the present, you know, whether it was the, the records that he was into right then and, you know, records slash CDs. But I mean, records were still something that were, I mean, now records are happening again. But I mean, back then, CDs had come in, but people still were listening to records, you know, and there was a lot of stuff that hadn't been released on CD, you know, back then. So mm -hmm. the only way you could hear it was was on record. He didn't talk about his childhood for a specific reason? Did he not like to talk about it or it just never came up? Well, I can't say why he didn't talk about his childhood. But in doing the, you know, I mean, cause, because that was, that he never specifically told me, you know, that never came up, you know. When I interviewed him, he talked about when he first started playing the guitar. And he talked about, you know, the guitars that he had had. You know, this was a story for Guitar Player magazine. So very focused on guitars, very focused on how he like came up with his riffs and stuff for, for various songs, that kind of thing. So he talked about his history as a musician a little bit. The reason I bring it up because his family is just so damn interesting. I mean, it, it, it reads like a Martin Scorsese film at times. His grandfather was a gambler and had another granddad who was a thief. Can you talk about that a little bit, his family history? You did speak with his family members and some of his friends, right? I spoke to both of his sisters, and I spoke to one of his nieces, and I exchanged email with one of his sisters quite a bit to sort of fill in you know, some of the gaps. Then I was able to talk to a number of his friends, one of his, his best friend in junior high school, and then a number of good friends in high school. And uh, this woman, Jane Fisher, who her older brother, Steve, was a good friend of Jimmy's in, in high school. But Jimmy would come over to the Fisher house all the time. They, their house was a real party house. And so she had a lot to say about, even though she was like three years younger than Jimmy, she observed him a lot and knew him. And so she had a lot of the interesting things to say about him. The Wilsey family, as my understanding from the research I did, they came to America from Holland and that the name ori originally derived from, it, the name was originally Wild Z, W-I-L-D-Z-E-E. -E, and that means wild people of the sea, which I think is, a, is pretty cool. I mean, Jimmy, had, he definitely had this sort of outlaw history, which you, you alluded to. I mean, in terms of his, his grandfather, who was a gambler, was arrested for gambling. You know, gambling was illegal in, in Kansas City. And his father, like, left home when he was, like, a, a young kid, got into the military when he was, you know, 16 years old, forged a, I guess, forged a driver's license so he could, he, he could get in. The other side of the family, there were, there were a number of people on the other side of the family that that were um, robbers for a, while, for a while when they were young, you know? Um, so, yeah, I mean, he had, he definitely had, had a kind of wild outlaw history. Well, and also he there. moved around a lot, you which know? is a theory when we get to talking about his addiction, there are those yeah, who I feel talk that. About, yeah. We'll talk about that, you know, but yeah, I mean, they'd moved, the family had moved, um, a number of times, you know, while he was still, 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 a, you know, a kid. Before he reached and, 10. Yep. And I can talk a little bit, you know, if, later we can, we could talk a little bit yep. about the, the impact of that. I mean, Jimmy was really, um, 
he was really into sports. You know, that was another part of him when he was in junior high school. I mean, him and his friends, you know, they'd play baseball all the time, wiffle ball, but he was also always a class clown and a very mischievous person. And um, one of his friends, Rob Georgian, told me about how Jimmy got a tape recorder and they, you know, he was able to hook it up to the phone so they could record, you know, phone conversations. You know, one of they used to, you used to be able to like kind of stick this thing onto your phone. You know, this is like, this is before cell phones. This is like, you know, when you had like a, a big black heavy duty phone and you had a receiver. And so they would, they would make these prank calls and they would ask some like ridiculous question and record the answer. And then they could, then they would, when this was over, then they would like, you know, you know, listen to this and laugh about it. And he played I'll, football I'll too, you. right? He played football, but he was too small. Well, yeah, that was, that was um, like the first, his first year of high school he played, but he, he, he either never actually got out on the field or maybe he got out there for like a minute or two at the very end of the game. If the, if his team was like way ahead or was way behind, then they might put him out there. But there's a funny photograph that I, I included in the book that shows Jimmy, who was probably the smallest guy on the team, standing in front of the tallest guy on the team. And Jimmy is like practically half this guy's height. <laughs> I got to look for uh, that. And that was in the high school yearbook. Yeah, he's a little guy. But boy, they, all of his friends said, yeah, he was determined to be a rock star. He wanted to be a rock star. And when you're growing up in Missouri, that's a quiet place. So that wasn't the place to be. He knew he was going to have to move out eventually. Well, that's what he told. You know, he told one of his girlfriends, you know, was that he was going to be a star. He was going to be famous. He oh, I'm great. looking at that photo, by the way. This is it's a black and white. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, my God. He is a little guy, huh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah pretty, behind yeah, him, pretty. the tallest player. <laughs> yeah, and he always had the long hair. His, his buddies were saying they were surprised when he cut it. You got to remember that when Jimmy was was in high school, which was early to mid seventies, that's what everyone had wore their hair long. Yeah, I mean that was you know it was like it was it was unusual when the Beatles came out in nineteen sixty four, their hair which was not particularly long by what, what happened later, but everyone talked about their long hair. And so it was an unusual thing in the mid sixties, but by the mid seventies, it was like, if you didn't have long hair, you were like a freak. I mean, it was, just, you know, it had just spread everywhere and it was just the norm. So it was, it was normal that Jimmy would have long hair at that point. As time went on, I mean, at one point, he painted his his fingernails black because Lou Reed had had his fingernails painted. So he he was veering towards the punk thing even before he got out to San Francisco. And the I mean and before the punk thing, I mean there was sort of the glam thing and then the punk thing. So those were both things those were happening. And Jimmy was, you know, he was into, you know, Iggy and the Stooges. He was way into David Bowie. He was into the Velvet Underground and, and then Lou Reed. But once he got out to San Francisco, now he was, you know, he pretty quickly, he had moved into the, the punk scene there, you know, because it was, it, it, it happened right as he's there. So, I mean, it's almost not like he moved into it. It was like it happened almost around him. And it wasn't long. You know, he was there for maybe three years. Was he with that band? Two, three years before he joins forces with well, he, he, Chris Isaac? He, was, he basically, he became a member of the Avengers in July of 77. And the Avengers broke up two years later. And then he co-formed a new version of Silvertone with Chris Isaac around August of 1980. The Booked on Rock podcast will return after this. The Booked on Rock podcast is on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash booked on rock podcast. On Twitter at booked on rock and on Instagram at booked on rock podcast. There were different stories that you got regarding when Jimmy and Chris 
form what became the second version of Silvertone, correct? Well, I basically ended up pretty much knowing what actually happened because I found that there was a gig that Jimmy did. Well, there was a gig that happened in August of 1980. Silvertone was a trio initially. Jimmy wasn't in it. It was Chris Isaac on guitar and vocals. There was a bass, stand-up bass player, and there was, you know, and a drummer. That was the original Silvertone. Well, they did a gig in August of 1980, and then Jimmy did a gig as a co-founder of the second version of Silvertone in late September of 1980. So once I actually nailed down those two gigs, then I knew when he had joined with Chris. But the thing was, when the trio was going on, Jimmy got brought in to do sound and to work an Echoplex machine. So that's how he got to know Chris Isaac. The, the Avengers had broken up. Jimmy wasn't sure he was going to be in another band. He was doing construction for a while. He hated doing construction. So he decided he'd just kind of do whatever he could in music to support himself. And then he got asked if he would, if he could run a Echoplex. And he said he could. He'd never had anything to do with one before, but that was how Jimmy was. He would and, just say he could do something yeah, and then he'd figure it out. Well, and yeah, he, it sounds like he, yeah, it sounds like he was the guy who could figure that stuff out. For those who don't know what that is, what is an Echoplex? It basically, you know, if you listen to Rockabilly records, you hear the echo on the vocal or guitars that have a heavy echo. That was long before digital reverb and digital echo. There, there was basically a device that had tape. It was a tape loop. And the loop would sort of, it would just like loop around. So it would take the note and you would, it would, it would produce an echo like sound. And so it was kind of a big boxy thing. I mean, it was, um, those things were, were like, you know, I don't know, 14 inches by eight inches high by, you know, 12 inches wide or something. I mean, it was, it was, they were, it was a big clunky box that you had to have, you know, you had your amp and then you had this Echoplex unit. You know, or you could plug a vocal into it, microphone, you know, into it and and put it on the vocals. So they brought Jimmy in to do that and and to basically just run the sound when when they would they were playing these clubs, including the Mabue Gardens. And Jimmy started showing Chris Chris Isaac wasn't a particularly good guitar player. And so Jimmy started showing Chris riffs. They were this trio was doing a lot of rockabilly covers. Jimmy had worked out all the guitar parts for these songs. So he could he could show Chris Isaac the lead guitar riff for, you know, Dixie Fried or whatever particular song that this version of Silvertone were doing. And then they also bonded over country music because Jimmy had grown up. His parents were fans of country music. So Jimmy had grown up hearing country music and he liked country music a lot. Chris Isaac loved country music. So this was something that these two guys in San Francisco where punk rock is is happening and here's two guys who did country music. So it was a it was a natural for, for them bonding over that. So then when Chris Isaac broke up the trio because he got sick of just doing all these rockabilly songs, him and Jimmy kept working together and really quickly put a new band together. Jimmy found a bass player for the new band and they brought back the old drummer, John Silvers. And so that was that quartet played a show at the end of September 1980. And that was sort of the start, really, of the silver tone that eventually made Chris Isaac records. Apparently, George Lucas was a fan of silver tone. You mentioned this in the book. Yeah, I mean, at one point, Lucas hired them to play at a party that he had out at his place. And I'm told that he had a silver tone poster framed and up somewhere but he definitely played he he definitely hired them to play so yeah how cool is that very cool it's particularly at a at that point in time when they weren't popular yet i mean they were they were a san francisco thing at that point i mean they had played la they had played new york but but san francisco was where they had the most the biggest following at that point in time Watching the video for the dancing single, which is from 1985, that's from the debut Chris Isaac album. I would never have known 
that Jimmy was wearing a wig. We bring this up in the book. Even his closest friends didn't even know he was he was going bald. That had to have been such a drag for him though, because he he had to adjust it and make sure it was just right. And his friend well, talked was. to you about that for the book. It was. I mean, I didn't know. I did not know. Never would have known Jim, that Jimmy wore a wig, or that you know, when I was around Jimmy, he always had had on a, a cap like I'm wearing. Otherwise, when he was on stage, I just thought that was his hair. I mean, really. I mean, that was a secret. That was really a secret. I was told <laughs> that he ca- he would keep his hat on when he would go to bed with with his girlfriends. <laughs> 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 I mean, <laughs> and the thing was. In 1990, when he developed a relationship with this actress, Jennifer Rubin, and she said it was really a big deal, a big deal for Jimmy when he finally would, you know, take his wig off, take his hat off and let her actually see him without a wig or a hat. That was a huge, big deal. I mean, that was sort of a real moment of trust in their relationship. So. Yeah, it was a big deal for him. And and um, the thing was that it was just like, you have to do this. I mean, Isaac and, and Eric, Eric Jacobson, you know, was the producer co-manager. It's like Jimmy was losing his hair and it wasn't looking so good in terms of, I mean, here's like a band of young guys and Jimmy, they were all good looking guys and Jimmy's, Jimmy's a good looking guy, but to have him bald, that just, I mean, nowadays, I mean, it's hard to, there's things that it's hard to imagine now, you know, now there's plenty of people with shaved heads yeah. in bands. Yeah. It's no big deal. It's nothing, but it was a big deal. And yeah, you know, MTV back, comes into, you got to have back that in the eighties. Yeah, the image image was everything in the eighties. He had a distinctive style and sound. Can you talk about his sound, how he achieved that sound? He gave you some great insight about that. Just basically letting things happen without thinking about the specific notes to hit and the well, chords. I mean, just let it all happen. Jimmy had just a beautiful tone that he developed. And it, it was there really in the beginning. It was always there, but it, it got refined as time, time went on. And the thing was, Jimmy used the whammy bar on his Stratocaster. 65 Fender Stratocaster. He had a volume, you know, a volume pedal, which he really liked the volume pedal because he could have it all the way down. So there's no sound and he could hit a note and then he could bring it up. And so you would just hear the sound swelling up of the note, but you wouldn't hear the pick against the guitar. And so that was something he really loved. As time went on, he got a, um, you can have a Telecaster modified so that you can it, it there's this whole spring device that goes into the back of a telecaster guitar and so it lets you achieve the sound of a steel guitar by pulling the neck of the c- guitar down you know like you have your strap on and because of the spring device you pull the neck down and the note that you're playing gets bent a little bit the way on a steel guitar when you press the one of the pedals pedal steel guitar so it can achieve this and this is a thing that Clarence White who was in the birds him and another guy developed this thing and so Jimmy got one he got one put into his guitar and so that was another part of his sound for certain things added nuances throughout i mean his sound was he was influenced by some of the 50s guys like Scotty Moore and the guitar player in the Shadows, which was a British band, early 60s British instrumental band. And the guitar player who who played on a number of the James Bond themes, Dwayne Eddy, Link Ray. There's a whole bunch of guitar players that Jimmy drew on. And so his sound was sort of in the ballpark of those guys, but it was his sound. You know, you, you listen to the records and it doesn't sound like he's just copying somebody. It's a distinctive tone, a distinctive thing. And, you know, a lot of times what he would do is he would look at the chords that were in a particular song. He'd look at the notes in those chords and he'd kind of use those notes to come up with specific guitar parts for the songs. You know, that's something that he would do a lot of the times. 
but he'd do other things too. I mean, there's a song on the first Chris Isaac album, an album called Silvertone, called Unhappiness. And Jimmy does backwards guitar on that. And basically what he did was be initially on a, like a four track little, you know, little four track recorder that they used when they were in their studio, just like rehearsing stuff. They put down like a drum track and kind of a rhythm guitar track. And then he basically was able to flip the cassette and on the other two tracks, because it was four track. So on the other two tracks, that didn't have any music yet while the song is playing backwards because he's flipped it. Oh, he's flipped it so that it's not playing forward anymore. It's if the, you know, the way it was by flipping it, it's now essentially playing the song backwards. And then he just played along to that all the way through. Then when he played all four tracks the right way, you had the original guitar rhythm part and drum part, but now you had the guitar part that he put down. Now that's being played backwards. When he was originally doing this stuff for the Chris Isaac albums, the early Chris Isaac albums, you couldn't do any of that digitally. That just did not exist. I mean, it was only when they got to, in 1989, when they, when they laid down the third album, Heart Shaped World, which is the album with Wicked Game, by that point, now there was some digital tools that you could use. But in 1985, and actually 1983 and 84, which is when they actually laid down the tracks for the Silvertone album that came out in 85, you couldn't do any of that. No. It, everything had to be done, you know, direct to tape. I didn't know Jim Keltner is on that. The legendary drummer Jim Keltner is on one of the songs on that album, the first Silvertone album, Living for Your Lover. It was mostly the drummer from the Tubes who did most of the drumming on the oh, first really? album. Interesting. But, okay, but they also did did um, you know have have Kelton. They were they were really having trouble with the drum sound, and basically they 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 fired the drummer and the bass player who were who had been in the version of Silvertone that that Jimmy had formed with Chris. They fired those guys because they just couldn't meet up to Eric Jacobson's perfectionism in the recording studio. They just couldn't do it. They were fine at gigs, but it just didn't. And, and Eric Jacobson, the thing about Eric, I mean, I, I don't know if your listeners know this, but Eric Jacobson in the mid sixties produced seven top 10 hits for the love and spoonful and the love and spoonful. Maybe your listeners don't have never heard the love and spoonful, but the love and spoonful were, a major band in the mid sixties and they were a great band. The song, do you believe in magic was their song and daydream. And they had just had a bunch of, of great hits and Eric Jacobson produced those hits. And then he went on and he produced spirit in the sky, which was a huge hit for Norman Greenbaum. Oh, he produced and, that. Okay. And, and, and he produced some other hits as well. So he was a major guy. And when he came across Silvertone, about a decade had gone by since he'd had a hit and he was trying to get back, sort of get back into the business in a sense. And he found these guys and he just fell in love with Isaac's voice and the sound of the group. So he was an important guy, but he was also a perfectionist in the recording studio. And basically he had the chops and he had the, because of his achievements, I mean, he was a totally credible guy. I mean, if Eric Jacobson says, these guys are just not cutting it, Chris. It's listen to this. You can see the rhythm is off. It's not on. The, it's not on the money here, and and it's got to be on the money. You know, your your songs are not going to sound the way they need to sound if you've got the beat moving all over the place. Yeah, and we should and mention so, they signed to Warner Brothers. Chris Isaac signed to Warner Brothers. He signed. Okay, Silvertone yeah. did not. I mean, they originally wanted Silvertone. They thought it was a group. You know. But in fact, by that point, the two guys in the band, the drummer and the bass player, well, everybody was under contract such that Chris Isaac could let them go whenever he wanted. And so by the time they signed with Warner Brothers, there actually wasn't a silver tone anymore. It's Warner just Brothers Chris didn't, Isaac. Didn't yes. really know that. It was Chris Isaac and Jimmy Wilsey. But 
And Chris Isaac and Jimmy Wilsey were signed to a production company that Eric Jacobson had called Transtone Music. And so Transtone actually did the deal with Warner Brothers, but Warner Brothers also separately signed Chris Isaac. So it was a situation where initially, and for for the first, you know, three albums, Warner Brothers would pay any royalties to Transtone. And then Eric Jacobson, in turn, would pay royalties to Jimmy Wilsey and to Chris Isaac. So that's how it that's how it originally worked, hmm. worked out. But Warner Brothers never actually signed Jimmy Wilsey. Talking yeah. with Michael Goldberg. He's the author of Wicked Game, the true story of guitarist James Calvin Wilsey, which is out now through Hozak Books. Wicked Game was a huge hit, but it took a few years, right? The album Heart Shaped World came out in 1989, summer of 89. The album came out in 89, but it was a total bomb. And that song was not released as a single here. It was released in Europe in some countries, but nothing happened with it there. Warner Brothers hated the album. I mean, when Eric Jacobson said the guy, some of Warner Brothers people came up to the Bay Area, there was a playback session and they did not like the album. They didn't hear any, any of the songs as, as singles. And so the album came out and within like a month or so, Warner Brothers had, it was over, forget it. So what happens is David Lynch, who had included some some songs from the first Silvertone album, Chris Isaac Silvertone album in um, Blue Velvet, David Lynch came back and says, have you got some music? I'm working on this film, Wild at Heart. And so I gave him a bunch of music and what he ended up using in Wild at Heart, one of the things was an instrumental version of Wicked Game, no vocal, just basically just Jimmy's guitar parts and a rhythm track. So that movie comes out in 1990 and a music director at an Atlanta radio station goes and sees Wild at Heart and falls in love with this instrumental Wicked Game. He goes back and sees the movie two more times to hear the song. And then he seeks out the soundtrack and when he finds this on, what's on the soundtrack is a version of Wicked Game with Chris Isaac's vocal. So he starts playing that on his station, even though there's no single. There's just him playing that on the station. Well, it gets a great response there. I mean, it's, it, it basically becomes a local hit in Atlanta. And so... But based on that, Warner Brothers now, we're talking 1990, you know, late in 1990, Warner Brothers now releases the song as a single. And David Lynch makes a video of the song, but his video doesn't get much play. It's then the next video, which is the video that everyone saw on MTV. The black and white. Chris Isaac and, and the, you know, the model. Ellen Christensen making love on the beach. That's the video that helped put it over the top. Wow. Yeah. And so Jimmy basically, you know, and Chris Isaac, you know, told me this as well. said Jimmy was really responsible for that song becoming a hit. If it hadn't been for Jimmy's guitar playing, that song, I mean, it just would have died. It never would have gone anywhere. It never would have been released as a single. It never would have been in the movie. You know, nothing would have happened. You talked uh, to guitarist Lenny Kay, best known yeah. as being a member of the Patti Smith group. He had some great comments on Jimmy's playing, specifically on Wicked Game. He called Jimmy a guitarist's guitarist. Lenny basically, what he said, you know, Jimmy is not a sh was, was not a showy player. Jimmy was a player who was serving the song and serving the vocalist. And he said, he basically said, the, the, now, the beginning of Wicked Game is two notes and you hear those two notes anybody who hears those two notes anywhere in the world at this point and they instantly recognize what's going to come what follows you know it's just um, two notes the way he plays those two notes yeah yeah makes all and the difference so, and so basically lenny said this was like the perfect it, it's like jimmy was like opening the door and leading you to Chris Isaac's vocal. And 
that was the kind of thing that Jimmy Jimmy could do. He could create a guitar intro that was a beautiful, unique thing that just brought you right into the song. And then Isaac starts singing. You're there now. You're in the song and you're going to be there for the rest of the ride. And of course, Jimmy's playing throughout the song is just is just beautiful and and unique. Yeah, and there's another song that and actually the last song Jimmy recorded with Chris Isaac, "Can't Do a Thing to Stop Me" from 1993. That's another one that you mentioned, and you say as good as the studio version is, not nearly as good as the live version. Unfortunately, well, your was, your cassette recording of that song yeah. is no longer with you. Yeah, this was terrible. Okay, I would I used to go to Chris Isaac Silvertone shows. And I had this I had this great cassette tape recorder. I mean, this thing was basically just a little bit bigger than an iPhone. And so it w- I could just take it in there. I could have my notebook and I could have it right under my notebook and I could record the set while I'm taking notes. And so it, this was just like so great and so helpful because later I could go back home if I was writing a review of a show and I could actually listen to the music. I didn't have to just remember it. And, and work off just my notes. I actually had the music I could work, work from as I was sitting there writing my review. So anyway, I went to this show at the Omni in Oakland, and they played that song, Can't Do a Thing to Stop Me. And I just thought it was like an incredible song, and it sounded so good live. So I had this recording, and I was driving around in my Honda Civic, listening to it on my tape deck in the this has been the day of we were still could you know had cassette decks in our cars um and so i was just listening to that over and over again and i left it in the in the car and that night i I go you know i go out the next morning my car has been broken into they've stolen the cassette player radio combo and sadly the tape was in there I mean, I'm sure the the thieves could care less. They could care less, but sadly, that was, and so I lost that. And oh. boy, do I wish, boy, do I wish I still, I still had that recording. I mean, yeah. I, I actually have, I have a lot of recordings of live shows uh, from over the years that they did. But boy, I wish I had that one. Oh man, yeah, that's that tape might still be out there somewhere. If you're listening to this, if you, stole <laughs> I wish, that. yeah, <laughs> I wish. Jimmy stopped working with Chris in 1992. What was Jimmy's reason for leaving the band? Or was it more than just one reason? Like creative differences? Did he Jimmy he Jimmy was, was fired? Because of the drugs? Was that the problem? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, Jimmy had started smoking Persian brown heroin around nineteen eighty five. At first, you know, he was just as I understand that he was, you know, he was smoking it sometimes, but it wasn't like his life. But then around eighty seven, he got into it more heavily. But then, you know, it's it's a weird thing. I mean, musicians, you know, you, you look at jazz musicians who used heroin for a long time. I mean, it's a drug that people can, they can use for a extended period of time and still function. Still function. Right, yeah, that's, right. That's the word. Yeah, some people you know? just thought he was drunk. You mentioned that in the book. People didn't, you know? didn't realize what he was doing. They just thought, hey, he's had a few beers or a couple shots. But instead, uh, I mean, I mean, that was also going on. But, uh, you know, I mean, he, you know, he he would get, you know, he would get seriously loaded on alcohol uh, at times as well. But what ultimately happened was Wicked Game becomes a big hit. And Jimmy's, you know, it's like if someone has a songwriting credit or, you know, if you're the, the songwriter and you're you got publishing money and songwriting you know, money coming in. Well, when, when there's no hit, it's not really that much of a big deal. But once a song, when you have a song that's like selling, you know, millions of copies, that money means a lot. And Jimmy wasn't getting any of that money. He, he didn't get publishing. He didn't you know, get credit. He didn't get any of that because the thing is, you know, the way it works is the, the sort of the legal way that copyright stuff works with songs is Chris Isaac writes a song he you know he comes up with the chords he comes up with a melody and he comes up with the lyrics okay he's the songwriter now somebody comes in and writes a brilliant 
guitar intro for that song, that doesn't make them one of the songwriters. We're getting into the Robbie Robertson, the band argument. <laughs> you know, who deserves to um, get credit? Yeah, but, he's the only. But, you know, looking here, Chris Isaac is the only songwriting credit. Yeah, and I mean, and there's nothing legally wrong about that. Chris Isaac wrote the song. He did. He wrote that song. But some bands, like the Avengers, they just split everything four ways. Didn't matter if Penelope Houston wrote all the lyrics and Jimmy came up with most of the music for a song, you know, or Greg came up with all the music for a song. And I mean, it didn't matter. They just split it four ways. And they did it that way. They did it that way for a reason, because they didn't want to get in, get into trouble. They didn't, you know, they didn't want to have have this situations where people were resentful. You know, hey, you're you're getting more money than I am. You know, they didn't want that situation to, to be the case if they became popular. So the thing was that Jimmy felt he deserved more. You know, rightly or wrongly, that's how he felt. He felt that he should have gotten more credit for coming up with with that intro and and he thought he should should make more money there had been a bitterness on jimmy's part that had sort of been developing for a long time but when wicked game happened it intensified the other thing that happened was he had this um girlfriend actress girlfriend jennifer rubin and she broke up their relationship in 1992 and the combination of where Jimmy was, his frustrations with the Chris Isaac situation, he was just devastated when she broke off the relationship. And when somebody is uh, addicted to heroin, they're looking for excuses. I mean, that's just kind of how it is. And so Jimmy had plenty of excuses to just go, you know, plunge. And, and the other thing was, that Jimmy did have money coming in because Jimmy got 20% of the royalties from, from the record sales. So suddenly he has, you know, tens of thousands of dollars that are like coming in. And so he could, he could buy all the drugs he wanted. Man, did he and burn so through he, all of it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he did. He did everything that was coming in. He ended up owing the government at one point, he owed the government $156,000 in taxes, unpaid taxes. Because he wasn't paying any taxes. Yeah. You know, he was just spending the money. So anyway, it got to a point in 92 when Jimmy, when he did show up for rehearsals, he couldn't remember his parts. I mean, he was just a mess. So basically, they fired him. But he also, the thing was, by that point, he was ready to go. He was just fed up with the whole thing. And um, while my understanding from additional research I did even after I finished the book was finished was that he was fired by Chris Isaac. He was ready to, to split, but I was told by Chris Isaac's manager that Chris hoped that Jimmy was going to get himself cleaned up and that Chris would be able to bring him back. That's what Chris's manager told me. And she also said that Chris Isaac waited three years before he hired a permanent replacement for Jimmy Wilson. Oh, so he was so, hoping. So, he was hoping so to that's, playing, yeah. So that's, yeah, so that seems seems like that, that all makes sense. And so meanwhile, he used a bunch of different guitar players on um, to finish. Like, Jimmy played on half of the fourth album, San Francisco Days. And to finish that album, Isaac used three different guitar players. And then he used um, hired guitar players after that till he... Um, hired a permanent replacement for Jimmy. The Booked on Rock podcast will return after this. The Booked on Rock podcast is online at bookedonrock.com. Find a list of all the major platforms where you can listen and subscribe to the podcast. Link up to our social media sites. Find out the latest books on rock releases. Find your nearest bookstore. And if you want to reach out to us, you can contact us through our website, bookedonrock.com. Chris was concerned for Jimmy. In fact, he did go with another friend, the photographer, famous sports photographer. We call him Z-Man, Michael Zagaris. 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 Yeah. They both went to see Jimmy, who had locked himself away for a while. And this was foreign to Chris Isaac. He was not a drinker. He didn't do drugs. He really didn't grasp 
the seriousness of it until that was one of those moments where he's like, wow, this is serious stuff. Well, yeah. I mean, Chris Isaac really prided and I'm sure prides himself on not drinking, not smoking, not using drugs of, of any kind, you know, illegal drugs of any kind. He, you know, he told me at one point, he said, I, I don't understand how, how these guys who are singers, how they can be smoking and, and doing drugs and stuff and, and keep their voices together. Yeah. He, he said, you know, he said, I think it really gives me a huge edge on, on all these guys that are doing drugs. The fact that I'm, I'm straight, I can keep my focus Especially on, on long it, term in the where, long run, absolutely. But he, what, Chris know, Isaac had a Moby Dick story. He related to Moby Dick about drugs <laughs> yeah. and alcohol. It's about distractions. Yeah. yeah, Chris Isaac told me that he really related to the captain in Moby Dick because the captain was obsessed. In the captain's case, he was obsessed with getting this whale. At one point, the captain throws his pipe over the side of the boat. And he said, and Jimmy said in school, uh, when they were reading, reading Moby Dick, he says, why did he throw the pipe over? Well, it was because he didn't want to have temptations to distract him. He didn't want to be comfortable. He wanted to be just like, to be able to be just totally focused. And, and that was how, that's Chris Isaac. I mean, Chris Isaac, from when he decided that he wanted to be a rock star, that was it. That was that was what everything that Chris Isaac was about was becoming a successful rock star. And he was willing to do as many re-recordings in the studio as it took to get the vocal right, write as many songs as he had to write to come up with enough strong material for the albums. And to yeah. that, he says to Michael Zagaris, let's just do an intervention. And well, Zagaris is like, yeah. it's not that simple. What happened was, this is after... You know, Jimmy's, you know, Jimmy's not in the band now, but it's like he can't get a hold of I me. Mean, the thing is, this is what happened. And I had the same experience with Jimmy. Suddenly, when you would call him, he wouldn't pick up the phone. I mean, here you were, you were going along, you know, I'd be going over to his place. We'd be watching videos. We'd be hanging out. He'd be playing me stuff. Every time I called, he'd pick up the phone and, you know, we get, you know, arranged to get together. And then suddenly... He's not picking up the phone and not just with me, with everybody who knew him. He's not picking up the phone. You go to his place and you knock on the door. There's no answer. And sometimes I would go around the side because there was a window that kind of looked in on where he had his computer set up. I go there and I'd knock and sometimes he'd be there and then he'd see it was me and then he, he'd let me in. But the times that happened, as far as I, I had no idea that he, that he was high. But this time that basically Chris Isaac and Michael Zagaris, who's now a famous photographer, he was good friends with both Chris Isaac and Jimmy Wilsey. He used to take them. He, he was shooting even back then. He was he was the photographer for the 49ers. And sometimes he'd have Jimmy out on right, the field with him, you know, helping him photograph the game anyway. Zagaris lived, you know, seven blocks or so from where Jimmy was living. So Zagaris and Chris Isaac go to this uh, storefront apartment where Jimmy was living to try to, because he hasn't been answering the phone, and knock on the door. There's no answer. Zagaris gets down and looks through the mail slot. The place is just a trashed mess. And he's like calling in there, Jimmy, it's Z. Come on, man, you know you know, come out here. We want to talk, talk to you. It's, you know, and then they finally, they just hear this faint voice, you know, and it's Jimmy's just saying, get out of here. I don't want to see you. Just, just get away. Just go away. So Isaac is like, what are we going to do? And Zagara says, says, there's nothing you can do. And Isaac is, according to Zagara, just doesn't quite get it, you know, and he's like, well, what do you mean there's nothing we can we can do? I mean, we can't we can't do an intervention. We can't. And Zagara says, look, what are you gonna do? You're gonna check him into like the Betty Ford clinic or something and spend, you know, back then, you know, eighteen thousand dollars or whatever, and that's a month. And then what? Okay. What are you gonna do after that? How is how are you gonna keep him clean if he doesn't want, you know? I mean, there's nothing you can do, man. 
Yeah, and, there was, uh, he, he needed to dig deep into whatever it was that was causing his depression, and you do go into that quite a bit in the book. So let's go back well, to that, what you were talking about as a kid moving around a lot. Like where? Well, here's the thing. Where I mean, did all this depression what, come from? One of the things when I began researching and reporting on the, for this book, one of the things I wanted to know was why did Jimmy become addicted to heroin? Why did that happen? And I did a lot of research over the, the, the years that I was reporting the book. And basically, addiction is a complicated thing. It's not just like you shoot heroin a couple of times and you're a heroin addict. It doesn't work like that. Some people can shoot heroin a couple of times and just put it aside. They don't become addicted to it. It's just, it just doesn't happen. But the factors that can lead to addiction, well, one of them is if your family moves around a lot when you're a young kid, that's a factor. And probably has to do with a lot of things like you can never, you know, you make friends, you have a friend, and then suddenly you don't have that friend anymore. You know, you're constantly in a different place and you're constantly, nothing is, there's nothing you can count on. Nothing is safe. It's right, right, it, right. So there's know. always that anxiety over, I'm going to lose this person. You get close to somebody, yeah. you're going to lose them. Yeah. And so, so that's one factor. Jimmy was clinically depressed. And when he was diagnosed as clinically depressed, the therapist said that, you know, this, this goes back to when, when you were a child. So we had that going on and that's a factor. And then he had, you know, military parents and his father in particular was like, kids are seen and not heard. That was that thing. And it was just like his father, he just didn't tolerate a lot of things as I'm told. And his mother was also difficult. So I think Jimmy was, was also in a situation where, you know, you're sort of tiptoeing around. He was the youngest of four children. And being the youngest is also a, a very difficult role to be in. And so these are all factors that can lead to addiction. And basically, it's like drugs become, you know, a way to medicate and a way to, to stop the pain. Because, you know, Jimmy said that when he took heroin for the first time, he told a friend, it was like I'd come home. It was like, it was instantly, the first time he took it, it was the most incredible feeling of, you know, sort of safety, security, just sort of the internal pain that he felt went away while he was high. And he had started, you know, he had started using alcohol and, and, and other drugs much earlier on. The heroin started in 85, but when he was in high school, he was drinking and, and doing other drugs. And, and so you learn, this is another thing about addiction is it's l learned behavior. You learn that this is a way that you can alleviate the pain you feel. And so that becomes another factor in this. And there's other factors too, and I, that I'm going to get into in the book. Persian brown heroin, right? That was what sent him down. Initially. That, yeah. And that, and that was, see, the thing was, that was going around in San Francisco, starting in the late 70s. Now, Jimmy didn't, as I'm told, Jimmy didn't start using it till 84 or 85. But it was there. It in, came into San Francisco. And these Iranian guys brought it in. And it was, it was happening. The, the Mabue punk scene, I mean, it was happening. And there were, there were, were a bunch of, of you know, drug deaths. What? overdoses uh, that happened what was um, it uh, what was it or what is it about persian brown heroin that is so instantly addictive after first trying it you get into well, this a little I, no, bit in the book i don't think it is i don't think it's it i don't think it's instantly addictive i think in jimmy's case because of all these different factors even then i don't think he instantly was addicted to it but it was something that he liked he wanted to keep using it because it made it, it alleviated this pain. But I mean, Eric Jacobson, you know, the co-manager, you know, producer, he started using it too, but he didn't become addicted. You yeah, know? yeah a lot, mean, you'll it, hear a lot too. It could be chemical, it could be psychological or somebody's upbringing, sometimes both. 
it's all these factors that can that can lead to it. But, but he, it's not he was a like, popular kid though. He was not a quiet. He wasn't. He wasn't at home all day after school. He wasn't sitting in a dark room, not talking to anybody. He was out there, and he had friends. He was popular. He played sports, like you said. And he seemed to have a pretty good childhood. Yeah, but seemed he was to. also. People said, you know, he was also kind of on the outside when there were groups of people together. Some of his friends talked about that. And Jimmy, he dressed unusually. I mean, you know, tw- you know, as the time went on in high school, he had this long trench coat that he wore and the thing with the black fingernails. And, you know, I mean, he was, yes, he had, he had friends, but he was also kind of on the outside. When Silvertone formed, it was like Chris Isaac and the drummer, John Silvers, were really tight. And they would they would like hang out together. They would go places together when the band wasn't, you know. But Jimmy, no. I mean, Jimmy didn't hang out with Chris Isaac when he wasn't working on music with him. Different kind of relationship. And Jimmy was always telling jokes. Jimmy was always trying to get people to laugh. But Jimmy, Jimmy was, he didn't talk about personal stuff with very many people. And then Jimmy also had a thing, and maybe this started with his parents, but his first girlfriend told me that she would really abuse him sometimes. She would like tell him, this is it. I'm breaking up with you. And basically he would have to beg her to stay. And she said, it was terrible what I did back then. Mm. You know, I wish I hadn't done it, but, but back then, I wanted him to prove to me that he loved me. So he was in that situation where he was on edge. He never knew for sure if his girlfriend wasn't going to just like tell him that it's over. That's the one you he know? was going out with when he moved to San Francisco. Yeah. And then his relationship with Chris Isaac ended up being kind of si- similar to that. Isaac used to he probably still does this with his other band members, but Isaac would, during the show, between songs, he would tell these stories, and they were like fun, funny stories. But a lot of times, Jimmy was sort of the butt of the joke. And a lot of times, those stories actually were based, in fact, of what we could might be going on in Jimmy's life. For example, he would create a funny story about the fact that Jimmy's girlfriend had broken up with him. And so here Jimmy is on stage, you know, and he's got to just stand there and listen to this happen. And a couple of Jimmy's girlfriends just said that it just kind of made them sick Mm. when they heard, when they went to a show and, and saw that happening. Jimmy, he never told me that, that that bothered him. But he told other people, there's sometimes he'd like roll his eyes when Isaac would start going off into one of those things. So, you know, he's in this situation, he's in this band where the, the leader of the band is very sort of domineering in a similar way as the relationship he had with his first girlfriend, Claudia Summers. So that was another factor, I think, in why the drugs were so appealing. Yeah. You know, because he could escape from that, you know. Yeah, it's 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 just unfortunate. It's just it really sad. sad. It's very sad it how is. this all played out. The Booked on Rock podcast will return after this. If you're a publisher or author of a book on rock and you want to be on the Booked on Rock podcast, contact us through our website, bookedonrock.com, or send an email to the Booked on Rock podcast at gmail.com. Wicked Game, the true story of guitarist James Calvin Wilsey, which is out now through Hozak Books. And Jimmy sadly died on Christmas Eve 2018 at the age of 61. Now, things seemed to be going good for Jimmy at the start of the 2000s. He had gotten married. He had a son, Waylon, in 03. He signs with a label, releases an instrumental album in 08, which was really good. Got a chance to listen to that while no, I was it's a great album. Yeah. Great album. He forms a band, plays some shows. His song, The Man Comes Around is used in a Brad Pitt film in 2012. So things seem to be going well. But what happens between then and 2018? Because I, I got to admit, I get a little welled up reading that opening chapter about the end. What happens from, say, well, well, t- 2008 to is, 2018? It's, it, you can't look at it like that. You got to look at it like 
it it basically once once it started once it got hit really really heavy in 1992 it never really went away yeah. i mean basically jimmy got clean in early part of like 98 but then he was using again and then he meets the woman that became his wife and he's kind of keeping it together for a while but then he gets all messed up on on heroin and he has to be his one of his good friends has to like take him to a to a place where a clinic where they can give him some drugs that to try to like to that basically stop the withdrawal from happening but then he within like a year or so he's back at the same clinic getting the same drug again because he's so messed up so he would have periods of time where he was keeping it together but he was he was probably chipping during that time where you're you know you're you're taking enough of the drug to kind of keep yourself together but you're not just going over the deep end to where you're just like messed up all the time but his relationship with his wife ended because he wasn't willing to give up the drug and it's sort of we can say okay it well he wouldn't give up the drug like it's a choice between his wife and the drug but for someone who's addicted it's really not like that you know i mean it's like and the person has to get to a point where they don't want to be a drug addict anymore they themselves have to get to that point and then once they get to that point it's not willpower that stops it it's doing the things that need to be done to get off the drug and not going back because you really don't want to go go back there but that's why people go to alcoholics anonymous or drug you know that's why people go to those programs multiple times a week it's like providing a support network that helps the person stay clean and jimmy never got to the point where he made that decision that he did want to be clean subsequently he'd go through rehab and then he'd just start using again because he hadn't actually made the decision that he had to make sort of deep down in inside him so basically he would sort of get where things were where he, he were basically he was like operating he was still probably using drugs but not to the point where it was getting in the way of things and he re- was able to record this solo album beautiful solo album that he did using his on his computer he did the whole thing on his computer in his dining room of, of a house in eagle rock where he was living at the time with his wife and uh, and kid we got to mention um, the title el dorado for people to check yeah. that out el dorado great, great album you can find songs from it on youtube and you can you can download it it's definitely worth seeking out. It's a beautiful, beautiful album. Well, I always have a playlist, Spotify playlist that goes along with each episode in the show notes. So I'll pop some of those songs into the playlist. So basically his wife leaves him right as this album is about to come out and the album comes out. He starts doing the shows, but he's also doing the drugs and then he loses his job because he, he actually had a job for about eight years where he was doing IT stuff at this marketing company. He was doing his, using his computer skills and he managed to keep that together for years, even through the drug use. But he lost that job. This is 2008. And then he's like, you know, using drugs off, off and on. Then he basically has, he had had um, hepatitis. So his liver was going out and he was going to have to get, basically he finds out in 2013 that he needs a liver replacement. And he actually manages to have that happen in 2014. He, you know, he managed to stay clean, I guess, for the six months or whatever that he had to, because they test you, you know, they do urine tests and stuff. They don't want to give, give a, a liver to somebody who's a drug addict, but he managed to like convince them that he was fine and he talked about how this was going to be the start of like a fresh chapter in his life and, and all this, but pretty quick after the transplant, you know, you have to take these drugs so that the liver will like not, the body won't reject the liver. 
those drugs aren't pleasant. He didn't like that. He didn't always take the drugs. He started taking other drugs. And, you know, it was just the same thing, just happened, kept happening over and over again. And then it just got to this to this point in 2018 where he was living in this house with his ex-wife. They were no longer a couple. It's just like she was living there. He was living there. A bunch of other people, some of whom were drug users, were living there. And they got evicted. And so then Jimmy is like living in his car just in the in the Eagle Rock neighborhood near where that that place was. And then pretty soon he's just like living. There's a this woman. She had a, a building in the Eagle Rock neighborhood. Los Angeles. She was actually yeah, Eva Ann Man- Manley. She has an audio company and makes high end audio gear and she had this building there and jimmy started sleeping on this on this like cement little like side passage that was kind of between the building and some shrubs and he'd put cardboard down and he was sleeping there and the first time she found him there you know she said hey hey you know she didn't know who he was it's just like you got to get out of here you can't you can't you can't be sleeping on my property Go, you got to go somewhere else. You know, I don't know where, but you got to go somewhere else. And she said the funny thing about Jimmy was like every other homeless person would have just left the mess that they had created there and just split. But Jimmy cleaned everything up and then left. And then, then she found him there another day. And he says to her, he says, you're Ivana Manley. She says, Yeah. And he mentions a piece of audio gear that her company makes. And he says there was a website that at the time was called Gear Slut. Now it's changed its name to Gear Space. But at the time it was Gear Slut. And Jimmy looks at her and he says, Gear Slut, because she was on on this audio site and he was on it. And she says, she's thinking to herself, "How, how is it that this homeless bum knows about gear slut, knows about this audio equipment that that my company makes. And she says, who are you? And he says, Jimmy Wilsey. Well, she doesn't know that name. But later, she goes and Googles Jimmy Wilsey and finds out, you know, he played guitar with Chris Isaac and the, the whole deal. So after that, she lets him sleep on her, you know, on her property. And she sometimes she brings some food out to him. Sometimes she brings some hot tea out to him. But she said it was just the saddest thing to oh, see him, you know, and, and he's kind of going downhill. And, and it just got to the point where one day he asked her if, if she would call an ambulance to take him to the hospital. And he went into the hospital and he went into a coma and then he died of organ failure on Christmas Eve day. It's just a sad thing. But, but the thing was, he was in this coma and some of his, um, his friends and family members were were there with him and one of them holds up their iPhone to his ear and plays wicked game. And Jimmy like smiles when he hears that. Oh man. And you know, it's just, when I heard that, I was just like, Oh my God. Oof. I, like I said, I just, I, like, I just started to well up a little bit reading that, man, you know, there's parts of this book that are really sad and that were really difficult for me to listen to the people tell me what happened and then to write it. You know, there were, there were points, there are, there are many parts of the book that were really difficult like that. But then there are also parts of the book where it was really exciting to be able to write, like to be able to write about how Jimmy created the music for some of the songs and, you know, the success that he did have and the kind of person he was, before the drugs kicked in in a, in a really bad way and the friendships that he had, he had really, really close friendships and the friendships they were, they weren't friendships where he was necessarily revealing a lot of personal stuff. Although with some of the, some of the friends that got really close, he did talk about his problems with drugs and and some of those things with them. Uh, He shared those things, but it was more just like situations where him and friends would just, they just hang out and they would like 
watch movies and they'd watch TV shows and they would come up with humorous stories that they would sort of bounce back and forth between themselves about their like musical journeys with music that was completely absurd that they really couldn't stand. They would fit that into the musical journey in a comic way. And, you know, and that was a way that Jimmy dealt with the pain, you know, was he was always trying to make people laugh. He was always trying to like distract from the in- internal sadness and pain that I came to believe he felt a yeah, lot of the time. Yeah. I, I, this book accomplishes more than just one thing. It's, it is a cautionary tale. It's a message to anybody who gets, feels like they're in deep depression and there's no help. There is help. Reach out for help because you don't want it to end up in this type of situation, which is so tragic. But the other thing is you've introduced the talent that he had. You've made people aware of who he is because most people will just hear the song. They love the guitar playing, don't know who played it. And you're also letting people know of who he was as a person, which I was going to finish with them. You last spoke with them in 2018. You were working on an essay. It was the last well, time. Well, I didn't, I didn't speak to him. I wish I had been able to speak it to him. It was a text. I, I had, yeah, I mean, I texted him because I was working on this essay about the Mabue Gardens. And I thought it would be great to get some quotes from Jimmy. And I had no idea the state that he was in. At the point where I texted him in June of 2018, he was living in this house, you know, with this whole, it was a whole drug scene going on in this house. I had no idea about that, you know, his liver thing. I didn't know any of that stuff. And I texted him and some time goes by and I don't hear from him. And then I get like, just like a a positive emoji, like a thumbs up emoji. And I'm thinking to myself, well, Jimmy, I need to talk to you on the phone. A thumbs up emoji is not, I mean, what's going on here? So I, I messaged, you know, I texted him and I said, you know, I need to get you on the phone. And, and then like a month or something goes by. I mean, we get to September now. And then he sends me a message that's, that says, oh, I lost my phone. I, you know, it was just like one of these messages that made me think he's got to be on drugs again. That's what this has got to be because it doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense. And that was my last contact with him. One thing I did want to say was the song Wicked Game has been streamed just on Spotify nearly 320 million times. <laughs> Okay. In the in now listen to this. In the three and a half years that I worked on the book, it was streamed 220 million times. I mean, just in that three and a half. I mean, this song. This, we're talking 31 years after the song was a hit, and it's so popular now that and that's just Spotify. That's not including the 50 plus or whatever million times on YouTube. That's not counting. God knows how many times on Apple Music. This song and, and on and it's played on radio stations to this day all over the world. Movies, I'm I mean, assuming too. For sure. I mean, this is a song that keeps that is as alive today as it ever was, probably more so. And it's Jimmy's incredible guitar playing leads you into the song. And so so his music lives on. But I wanted to try to have who he was. Jimmy the person live on. I, I just felt like, and, and I got to say, I'll tell you what started this was Jimmy died. I read about it on Facebook the day after he died. Christmas Day, I read about it. And I was just shocked. I practically fell over. I couldn't believe it. He's only 61 years old. What is going on here? You know? And so then I expected that there was going to be an obituary in, you know, in one of the newspapers. And there was nothing in the San Francisco papers. There's nothing in the LA Times. And I'm like, how can this be? He was a major guy in two important San Francisco bands. He lived in LA for the last 20 plus years of his life. Why? Nothing in Billboard. So I contacted an editor that I was, you know, I had worked at Rolling Stone for a decade. That was quite a while ago. And But I contacted an editor that I knew there and I said, hey, you know, Jimmy Wilsey died and I really think he was an important guy and there should be a story about him. And he agreed with me, the managing editor. 
So I reported a story and, and it ran in Rolling Stone online. It's still there. Just do a, do a search for, for Jimmy Wilsey Rolling Stone and you'll get a couple of stories that'll come up. The King of Slow, that'll come up because that was how, how he referred to himself. But so I did that story, but I felt like there was more to Jimmy's story. So I did a much longer story. That story was 2,000 words. I did an 8,000 word story for an Australian publication, Rhythms, that I write columns for. And basically, they're they're nice enough to like basically let me kind of write about whatever I want to there. And so, so I did that piece. And then I just well, I got to say, Greil Marcus read that piece, and he said because I'd been where I was working on this collection of my music writing pieces from the from the past 45 years or so. And Greel said, you got to include that piece in the book. And so I thought, huh, well, yeah, maybe I'll include it in the book, but I think I want to do some more reporting. And so I started doing more reporting and the piece started growing. And pretty soon I said, you know, this is a book. This isn't going to be a long magazine story that's going to be part of this collection. This is going to be its own book. And so then I spent the next, you know, basically spent three and a half years reporting on writing the book. How do you think he'd um, feel about this book? What do you think he would say to you? Well, if this was a book about some a musician that he knew, I think he would feel great. I think he there's probably things in this book that he wishes weren't there, but my feeling was that if I was going to write a book about Jimmy Wilsey, I was going to have to tell the truth, that I needed to tell the, the full true story of who he was. And that meant that there was going to be highs and there was going to be lows, you know. And the thing is, what's been really cool is that family members and people who were friends of Jimmy have told me that they really felt like I really did a fair job and they they felt like they i mean a, a bunch of people have told me they just couldn't put the book down once they started reading it and they were really glad that i had written it i didn't need people to tell me that to know that this book was was a good book i mean i knew it when about the time i was finished with it i knew i knew that like it was the best thing i'd ever written but um but to get that kind of feedback it it just it reinforces my own feelings you know and it's like well, cool, you know. Yeah. Well, this, I'll this just say, great, uh, but, you know. for me, when I sat down to start reading it, hours went by like nothing. I mean, I was just in it the whole way. And Thank beca you. because you start, you started off with that October 2018 story. I just thought, man, who is this person? I wonder what, what happened, you know, and who is he all about? And I love all, all the comments that you got from people that knew him. Nice guy, quiet, never got angry. Some even said he was a mystical guy in a way. And they also said he was the mystery man. Mystery man. You know? Yeah. And of course, he had called one of his bands The Mysteries. And that was based on a song by The Shadows that he loved called Man of Mystery. I think he really, he, I think he liked that. Um, so well, someone once asked him on Facebook, he said, are you going to make any appearances near where I live? And Jimmy says, I don't do appearances. I do disappearances. Ah, I love it. I mean, that's a great quote. That's what he yeah. said, you know. <laughs> well, I'm just glad that, you know, now I listen to this song and I put a face and a name to the guitarist. It's not just, well, I love that guitar and that song Wicked Game. Well, yeah, I mean, it's like... A lot of people don't even know who did it. He was an important musician. He he should He should get a lot more credit, I think, than he gets, you know. I mean, I think he should be in these, like, top 100 musician lists. I think he deserves yeah. to be there. I think his story is a story that's worth telling, and it's a story that that would be important for a lot more people to know for a bunch of different reasons. There's who Jimmy was and what Jimmy contributed, but there need to be cautionary tales. Musicians and other people need need to hear and and see what can happen if you go down the wrong path with drugs. Yeah, you know? see if you could save at least one life. If one person reads this book and says, I've got to get help after reading this, then mission accomplished there. That would be great. Well, too. yeah, I mean, that's certainly how, how I, I feel. I hope that's the case. I hope that it dissuades some people from going that, you know, 
there's a lot of things that, that like I said, that I, I think the book does. And I'm glad that it operates on a lot of different levels. And you do want to mention, we were talking about this before we started recording, the book Where to Get It, but also you wanted to talk about his son, too. Yeah. Well, well, Jimmy's son, Waylon, Waylon Wilsey, he is a teenager now. He's 18. And he's a really good student. And I decided very early on, once I realized I was writing a book, that I wanted to donate 25% of any royalties that I got to Waylon. And that's what I'm doing. I'm not deducting my expenses. I'm not, none of that. It's like 25% of, from dollar one that I get for royalties goes, goes to Waylon Wilsey. And I felt this was the only, I just felt like, hey, if I'm going to write about his dad, I want him, I want him to at least get some money, you know, out of this, you know, we, I don't know how many books will sell. I don't, you know, it's not going to be a fortune or anything, but it'll be some money that'll go to, that goes to Waylon. And um, I just felt that was an important thing, thing to do. That's cool. Yeah. Um, that's, that's awesome. You know, Have you spoken with him? I haven't. I haven't talked to him and I didn't, I didn't try to talk to him. I didn't think that that was, you know, he's a teenager. He was present for a lot of things that a kid shouldn't be present for. And I didn't want to like be interviewing Waylon Wilsey about his father. That's just not something that I felt was appropriate or that I wanted to do. It's been known for a long time, you know, for years that I've been researching this book. His guardian knew, I mean, she's the one, the money goes to him through, through her. And I talked to Jimmy's sisters. I talked to another niece. So if Waylon wanted to contribute something, it could have gotten to me, but I didn't want to be going to anybody and saying, I just didn't think it, feel it was appropriate. It'd be so nice I, if you know, could just at least just reach out to him or he reaches out to you. You, know, you guys have a conversation, just a nice talk you know, about his no, dad. It would be, it would be nice. And maybe that'll happen, happen at some, some point, but um, that's totally, it's up to, you know, to Waylon. I mean, yeah. I, you just don't want to, I, I, you know, I just felt like I didn't want to be sort of pushing myself on, on him. Yeah. He named him after Waylon Jennings, right? Oh yeah. That's where he got the name. Oh yeah. And here's the crazy thing. He told one of his girlfriends when he was in high school that eventually he was going to have a son and he was going to name him Waylon. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's in the book. That's yeah. in the book. Yeah. yeah. That's so um, awesome. And so, yeah. So the thing is, if somebody wants to buy this book, I really encourage them to go to Hozak Records and Books, put that in Google go to that website. And the reason that I would hope that people will buy it directly, and a lot of people have been buying it directly from, from the publisher, is because myself, Waylon, and the publisher, who it's an indie, indie company, this is not a big corporate book company, this is an independent book company, we all make a lot more money per book sold if you buy it from the website, the book publisher's website, and that's the cheapest place to buy the book. Okay. You can't get it any cheaper than from there. So that's the best place to get it. But it's just the way, the way, you know, publishing works. It's like, if you buy it, you know, you buy it through a bookstore, they take half, you know, you buy it from Amazon, they take, take a big chunk. So I'll put a link up to that, a direct link to hozakrecords.com. The book's right on the front page. If you click on the link there, you'll get a specific link. That would be the one to give people because that'll take them directly to a page where they can read a bunch of information about the book, see a bunch of photographs that are in the book, and decide if it's something that they're interested in. That was one other thing that we didn't touch on that I wanted to say, which is this book, it's 414 pages. There's 150, over 150 images in the book. There are tons of photographs. There are flyers. There are posters. There are record covers. There are photographs by some of the best rock photographers, period. You just flip through the book and you just come across tons of amazing photographs. And there's Avengers posters that Penelope Houston, you know, the singer, because she's an artist as well, did. There's, there's a poster for the Avengers that Jimmy designed very early on in the book. One, one writer said that he had never read 
a uh, biography that integrated so many photographs into the biography in a way that really helped tell the story. And I think that's true. And, and that was one of the things that I was really glad that um, Hozak Books wanted to publish this, this book because Hozak is pretty unique in the world of books um, in terms of wanting to include tons and tons of images in their books. I don't know anyone else who, who does it, you know, because sure, like a coffee table book, a photo coffee table book is images, but just how many biographies have you ever read that had, had you know, over 150 images in it? Michael Goldberg, this was great. Thanks so much. It's been really great to be able to be on your show. I really appreciate it. I want to give a thanks to Mark Slade of Twisted Pulp Magazine. He helped set this interview up with Michael. And thank you, as always, for listening. Make sure you visit our website, bookedonrock.com. Give us a five-star review wherever you listen, and subscribe if you haven't yet. I'm Eric Senich. Join me again next time for another brand-new episode of Booked on Rock. That's it. It's in the books.